Hey, and good morning, and thank you so much for showing up. For a moment, I thought I was going to be alone here at 9 a.m. Um, I was kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, my name is Tess, and I'm a data scientist and a software engineer at Microsoft. And I've been doing machine learning for, for a few years now, and I'm always curious how much like the machine learning community grows. So who in here um, is doing machine learning for their job? A couple. More and more. So who, who has actually dabbled in it, like who has tried it before? Yeah? It's fun. Uh, so my job is to travel around um, and help customers with machine learning problems and get them started on machine learning and essentially kickstart um, and also put, uh, pr put machine learning models in production. So a couple of the things, so this is my, the team that I usually travel with, and a couple of the projects that we've been working on are this one, uh, which is uh, building highlight reels for soccer, like for, uh, for big league uh, soccer games. So taking um, soccer game videos and figuring out when someone is shooting on goal, when someone is attacking and things like, things like that. So I'll talk a little bit about how we attacked a problem like that later. Another one that I've been working on has been um, cancer detection. So this one was one that was really, really uh, close to my heart because it's the first time I ever felt like I actually did something that mattered as a software engineer. So this was um, using digital pathology slides, helping doctors to identify morphed cells quicker than they can normally, um, and thus speed up the time it takes for, for a patient to come to, to a doctor and get treatment. And the final one that I'm going to talk about later is shoplifting. So this is using cameras, like CCTV cameras in shops, uh, figuring out if someone is shoplifting. Now, this was not necessarily to intervene um, for the shoplifting, so it's not real time, but it's instead afterwards trying to figure out like what, what kind of things do people do, like how can they improve their stores to reduce shoplifting and things like that. But before I get into um, these projects, I wanted to just give a little bit of background of deep learning, because deep learning is what uh, we're using in these cases. So I'm going to start with a very canonical case of um, trying to sell a house or trying to buy a house, trying to figure out what a house is worth. Um, mostly because just recently I actually sold and bought, bought a house. I'm moving into my new house next week, actually. Um, and to try to figure out what a house is worth, we have some type of input. So some information about the house, like where it's located, the area of the house, that sort of stuff. And then we have something we try to guess, which is the price of the house. And this is in Swedish crowns. And, um, and what we're trying to sort of target is creating a function that will now map the input to the output, as if it was written um, in regular code, but have the machine do it for us. So one way to go about this, if we don't think about machine learning, is what I did, which was I hired two realtors and I asked them, hey, what do you think our house is worth? What would you want to sell it for? And they both came to the same conclusion. And I think they used a formula something like this. Um, in fact, they came to the same conclusion, but then they also had a margin of 250,000 crowns, um, Swedish crowns in this case, but it's, I guess, similar to Nor Norwegian, uh, which left us with like a, a confidence margin of half a million crowns, which is actually a sizable amount. That's not something that I can just pull out of my bank account like that. Um, so the reason why they couldn't give me a better estimate is, of course, because we don't have a lot of the information that we would need to make a super solid estimate. Like something like, who's going to show up? Is it going to rain the day we're going to have our showing? That sort of thing. It's like you never know what's going to happen. But you can create an estimate, and an estimate is exactly what machine learning does. So the other way to go around it, then, go about it, then instead of hiring a realtor, is 
for the developer to hire a realtor and for the, the realtor to say, hey, this is how I come to the conclusion I have like this. We start off at 100K and you have a certain uh, value per square meter and if it has a pool, it has um, this value and so on. And you can look at this as a very a simple math function that's basically is the number of features times the number of weights and then this green thing here and like the starting price that the house will be worth no matter what is generally called a bias in machine learning terms. So this is not deep learning, this is very shallow learning, this is um, um, something called linear regression and you can do this almost in Excel if you want to. You can plot out your data points for, for houses and you can estimate a line that will generate sort of this equation. And this will be a fairly good model that will give you that 500k um, estimate difference. In this case, the sort of what you see in pink, um, like the pink marker, is the confidence interval because the line will make the prediction, but you will always be a little bit off because not everything will follow this formula exactly. So this is linear regression, and I bring this up because when we talk about deep learning, suddenly we get, to, like we go from here, and this is fairly easy to understand, and we fit the line, it doesn't really matter how we fit the line, we fit it with something called gradient descent. This basically is determining like how the slope should go, and you fit it a little bit better like that. But it's a quite easy uh, explanation. But then we get into deep learning, and suddenly it's like a bunch of bubbles um, with some lines in between them, and you go like, Tch! Like, what the heck happened there? But as it turns out, deep learning is just a lot of these linear regressions put together. Like, it's an orchestra of linear regressions, sort of like combined. And the reason why we combine them like this in this huge neural network that's supposed to somehow mimic our brains, which it doesn't do, is because not all things are linear. You can't always explain something with a curve or with a line like that, with a simple equation. So you need to combine them and create non-linear relationships. And by non-linear, I mean that, for example, the house price per square meter in Stockholm is way different than the house price per square meter in um, somewhere else. It very much depends, and you need to use like combined features to to do a few things. So you can either then go through and create these features. Let's say you create features sort of like, this is a family size house, this is um, a good school area, or this is a hipster community which works better for like small apartments or whatever. But instead with deep learning and creating like these nonlinear relationships, deep learning will learn these relationships for us so we don't have to do a lot of feature engineering. So that is sort of the promise of deep learning. Um, but in reality, you see a lot of these small linear regressions. So the promise of deep learning is also that given enough samples, we will find the function. Like, literally, like there is no function that you cannot express with uh, a deep neural network. In fact, if you have a network that's like two layers deep, you can express everything. It just takes a long time and it might be very wide. But the key here is given enough samples, and not only given enough samples, but also given the right samples. Because I can't use a bunch of samples from Stockholm and assume that they will uh, work well in Oslo. And same way, I need to have samples that represent everything that a neural network needs to learn. And knowing what kind of troubles my realtor has, like she doesn't have all the information that she needs to make a very tight decision, the neural network can't do that either. It's not like the neural network suddenly has some magic power and knows who's going to show up on, on like next Sunday. So just keep that in mind, that even though the neural network can learn, to learn everything, it needs good data to do this. So this is working with structured data. So structured data means that you have everything in a table, there is like um, 
features here, and there's a target value here, or um, um, your output value. Uh, but sometimes you don't have structured data. You don't have data that fit into a table. Instead, you have something like images. So computer vision is built on this. And in images, it does matter where the pixels are in the image. It does matter that this pixel is beside this pixel, that's beside this pixel, and so on. So space matters, like the location matters. In structured data, you could literally swap the columns and no one would care. Like the machine learning algorithm would work the same. So deep learning can also deal with these through something called convolutional neural networks. And we'll go through that a little bit. And it can also deal with time or sequence. So something like a time series or uh, something like um, a sentence where the order of the words actually do matter. You can do that with recurrent neural networks. So, if we want to go through and, and classify something like a chihuahua or a muffin um, and try to make a neural network that determines how, um, which one is which, if you would do that as a human being, can anyone say, like, who thinks this is a muffin? Okay, one person. What made you think it was a muffin? The color, the color. The color. <coughs> Big spot. Anyone who thinks it's not a muffin? Okay, <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs> you might want to <laughs> want to eat something else for breakfast, actually. Um, so I'll ask you, what made you think that it was a uh, chihuahua or not a muffin? <laughs> yes. Uh, it says like a dog, a normal dog has eyes and the shape eyes and the shape of his head and ears. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, a couple of features like that. So how would you figure out these features from an image? Because for example, in the house case, you can kind of figure out like how you would do in like a family-sized house. It's like maybe a house that's got X number of rooms and a certain size. But how do you do that from an image? Any thoughts? One way to do this is uh, like this. So this is a um, pretend neural network. And in the first layer, we can put in filters. So these are the same type of filters that you would use on in any kind of like graphic software. Sometimes like maybe a Sobel filter that will learn like left edges and it will make your image, make your edges stand out. Or you could have a, a filter that only filters through like the brown colors. So you can use that to determine <laughs> it's a muffin. Um, and things like that. So all of these things combined now, so we can use filters and get out these features to figure out, like there's lines and there's uh, brown and whatever, and then we can combine them. And just like we could combine like the very uh, simple features in the house case, we can combine these to ears and eyes and things like that eventually. And finally get to the point where it's got two ears, it's got two eyes, it's got like this shape, and, and therefore, it's a chihuahua. But you stick with the house case, we don't actually have to figure out these filters on our own. It's not like we go in and say, first layer, Sobel filter, brown filter, red filter, whatever. Instead, the neural network will learn this for us from a large number of samples and kind of um, gradient descent and getting to that. So a convolutional neural network works a little bit like this. Um, you have a few layers. The first layer then has a number of filters. You choose maybe, I don't know, 32 filters. And then the small boxes here are something called pooling. So pooling means that we're trying to downsample. We're trying to sort of compress the output space and say, for every four pixels, pick the one that activated the most, like the one that showed the most that it was like brown or not brown or something like that. And then we pick that value and let that value be the value for all these four pixels. So this is just a way of downsampling. And you don't need to know sort of the details of this, but that's how it works. So you have convolutional layers like the filters and then downsample, filters, downsample, filters, downsample. And eventually you end up with a representation that's now a bunch of numbers that says we have this much chihuahua-ness, we have this much, I don't know, brownness and 
airiness and things like that. So, and then from that we can do the um, we can do the classification. So this intermediate layer, and this was when when I discovered this, this was sort of like the holy grail of like, wow, I kind of understand this um, machine learning thing now because this is what all deep learning does. It takes you from sort of like the original space to this code, to this embedding or intermediate representation or secret code or whatever you want to call it, which is essentially just an array of numbers that have features. So you can think of these features a little bit like the area and the zip code and things like that, but representations of what this image contains. So thinking about it in, in a little bit different way, if I were to recommend a book this is my Kindle library, and I want to recommend a book to my husband and to my daughter. My daughter is 16, my husband, I don't want to tell <laughs> his age, but um, uh, obviously they're going to have quite different tastes. And uh, if I think about like if, which I would recommend to which, uh, one way to figure out which one would fit which would be to sort them and say, this one fits uh, an adult, and this one fits a kid more. And she'll probably like the ones on, on this end of the spectrum, like John Green and, and Hunger Games and whatnot, and he'll probably like Michael Connolly a lot better, and things like that. So that's a nice way. So in that case, this feature would be a one or a minus one, depending on where you are. Now. Obviously, if we want to, we could give it a little bit more depth and say, what if I also put another axle that says it's a fiction book or non-fiction book, because that might tell me a little bit more about what I should recommend to different people, depending on what their likes are right now. And we can go on and now put another number on, on these, and now they become sort of like a representation in two dimension where things that fit together, like Divergent and The Hunger Games, end up in the same locations. And this is a very, very nice thing, because now you have a geometric representation of something where similar things fit together. Like, similar things are in, in um, the same space in, in this geometric um, representation. And you can use that to say, um, if you like this, you'll probably like this. We could add on more things. So we could add on things like, do they have math references? Is it US-centric, or is it a chiclet book, or funny, or sci-fi, or does it have lawyers, or would Brad Pitt play a character in the movie? Whatever. And you don't even have to figure out what these things are and give them a name and sort of uh, determine what every number means. In fact, deep learning will do this for you. They will come up with random things that don't actually mean anything, but they are good representations. They give like some semantic meaning to what this book is. That's a little bit deeper and that you can then use to classify things. So, um, you can do this with words. And if you do this with words and you train it on a large uh, amount of text, you'll end up with words that are similar, that fit together, like this. In fact, you might notice that um, disappointed shows up with all the happy words, but in all respects, except for maybe negative and positive, like it's a strong feeling, so it should end up in the same location. But things like this allow you to, to say, okay, so instead of yes, these few characters, this word has a lot more meaning now, and I can replace happy with delighted and things like that in, in text, which is very, very useful. And in fact, because it has a geometric representation, the actual distance or the actual relationship between them also has meaning. So the vector in space between man and, and king is roughly the same as woman and queen. So you can create analogies, which is also very useful for understanding uh, text and word and things like that. And you can extend this, so in the next space you can do this for faces, right? So this is my actual embedding for um, 
for a picture of my face. And what this allows me to do is if I can extract, like if I can use a pre-trained model and extract this information, I can now store this 300 uh, character long or 300 number long array in a database, and that is my representation of me. And if I go in and I want to do face verification, I can just compare to that. So that is the only thing I need to store. I don't need to store like a thousand images of me. I just need to store this one thing in the database. And that's very, very useful. So this is an example of how it looks. So this is um, from FaceNet, um, 128 dimension embedding. You can sort of choose uh, the dimension of the embedding. And the more dimensions you have, the more features it will represent, but also the more data you will need to actually create that. But um, this is sort of projected in 2D, so you can think of like, if you can even think of 128 dimensional space, but you just look at it from one direction, uh, flat, is to be able to represent it. You can see these light blue dots, those are all pictures of me. And then you have other color dots that are pictures of someone else. So if we look at it like this, you'll see that all my dots fit very, very closely together um, and in fact, they hardly even sort of inter interject with anyone else's. So you can use this now to do verification. And you can also use this to see similarities. So uh, people that are around me in space are probably very similar to me. The fact that, um, that these three happen to end up here is because this is in this projection. If we were to look at it, from over here instead, like that, we would get a slightly different projection where we wouldn't have um, that clear distinction between uh, the skin color making such a difference in this. In fact, in that case, maybe male-female would be uh, a lot heavier distinction. But you can also see, for example, with Serena and Venus, they're very similar, and most of the pictures that I had of them had um, like tennis, um, thing, so that's why they also show up um, very, very close together. So, if we look at that, and let's see if um, I can do this. You don't actually have to train like a face recognition system in order to be able to um, in order to be able to use face recognition. A lot of people have done this before you or before me, so we can use pre-trained models. And in fact, in this case, I only have like one single image of a number of different people, and it will now accurately um, find all of them. So um, this is just using um, CV, um, OpenCV, which is a image uh, library that you use a lot to process images before you do machine learning. And it will sort of like with just one picture of me, it now recognizes me. And it also recognizes my friends. Yay. Um, with just one single picture. So this is something that you could use um, today in, in your applications for doing like face identification or just face recognition. So, what else can we do with this representation? So let's say we take an image of a cat and we bring it down to its representation. So this is now the code for the cat in the pre-trained model. We can now do something called um, a generative network, which basically means instead of downsampling things, we upsample uh, and we make it bigger. And we get another representation of the same image. Uh, so Basically, we now, instead of compress, we, we expand it, and we get something like this. The, this is trained to do exactly this. So what this does is it does segmentation of the image to say exactly where in the image do we have cats and exactly where in the image do we have trees and things like that. So you can use an encoder and a decoder together, kind of like a Lego, Lego pieces. Or you can use something like encode a piece of text with a recurrent neural network, get to the representation, and then generate a new piece of text, like a response to this text. 
Or you can take something like an image, like a convolutional neural network, get the extract, like extract the embedding, and then answer with a piece of text that's now the caption for this image. So deep learning is extremely, extremely powerful in the sense that you can just build and match and do some really, really nice things that you could never do with just linear regression, for example. So in practice, this is how it works. I just need to see where I am time-wise. Um, right, so we have uh, our chihuahuas and muffins. And the first thing we do is we gather a lot of images of the chihuahuas and muffins, and we split them up into three different uh, pieces. So we have a lot of our data used for training. So this is what the machine learning model is going to learn from. And then we have a few images set aside for validation. So in each step, once you've trained, you also check that it works well on data that it hasn't been trained on. This is crucial because otherwise you can learn brown and think it's a muffin, where in, uh, in reality, like brown might mean something else in the validations that it might not um, conform to, to all the muffins in there. Uh, and then eventually, once you have a model and you iterate it through it, you go through and do it on a test set. And the test set should be very, very similar to what you expect your final data to be. So the training and validation could actually be sort of images of, of the internet, even like studio pictures of, of muffins and chihuahuas, but then your test set that you want to validate against should be like the uh, mobile um, blurry images that you expect from your customers. You so you verify that it actually works on, on the full population that you're training or that you're working for. So you get a batch of images, a random batch of images, some chihuahuas uh, marked as zero and some muffins marked as one because machine learning doesn't know about muffins and chihuahuas, they know about ones and zeros. And then you build a neural network and if you remember this picture, this is essentially what a neural network looks like in code. This is uh, Keras, a Python framework by this guy Francois Cholet that lets you abstract and create neural networks very, very quickly. So if we look at the first line here or down here, we see convolutional uh, layer with 32 filters, three by three, max pooling, another convolutional layer with 64 filters, we flatten it out. This is where we actually create the embedding. Our embedding in this case is going to be 512. And then we want out a 1 or a 0, where 1 means muffin, 0 means not muffin or chihuahua in this case. And then we fit it. So this is the training piece. We actually compile it in between, but it doesn't really matter. And in this case, we say, go through the data 20 times, all of the data go through it piece by piece in batches and, and train 20 times on this and then give me something. And then you can, after you've done this, you can train 20 more times or 100 more times or 1,000. It depends on, on what you want. And you end up with something like this, which is just like a listing of how good uh, this was. So looking at one of these items, we can see that it took 16 seconds on this um, surface book with a GPU to go through the 500 images and train on them is one batch or so one one epoch and we got 98.65 percent accuracy on the training data so that's pretty pretty darn nice like it gets almost every picture correctly however it only got 91 percent on the validation data so this is the data that uh, it hadn't seen, but the, we used as validation. So this is, a, um, I think, maybe in like um, 20, 40 pictures or something that it's testing on. So 91 is still fairly good. It's like every 9 out of 10 is going to get correct in this case. But we can do a little bit better than that. And um, we have to worry a little bit about the difference between um, the training data and the validation data, and this is something called overfitting. And what this means is then when we train, 
we actually learn too much about the details of the, the training data. We learn things like there's a pixel up here in the corner that probably means muffin, or um, I think all the muffins are chocolate muffins because that's what I had in my training set. So it learns like these details that are not general enough to work on the validation set. So overfitting is sort of like the bane of all machine learning projects. So what can we do to, to make it more general? Um, one way we could do, we could fix this, is get a lot more pictures of chihuahuas and muffins and put them in the batch and make the, the system learn better. And even uh, doing things like having more muffins that look like chihuahuas and things like that, so bring them closer together so it's harder for the network to train, would also be something that we could do. But one thing that's easy to do and that's uh, actually available in most of these frameworks is doing something called data augmentation. So data augmentation for images means that you're going to take all the images you have and randomly do certain things to them. Like it could be rotate them a little bit or flip them over or translate them a little bit and things like that such that they still look like chihuahuas but they're just a little bit different. So we now get the information about, we can now handle images where the chihuahuas are looking the other way or where the chihuahuas are rotated a little bit and we get away from the, the whole, it's learning a certain pixel in a corner, that kind of thing. So data augmentation is very useful and it's very easy to implement. Another thing we can do is also do something called a dropout. And dropout means that uh, randomly, for every batch, we're going to say, forget about this filter. Forget about the brown filter and forget about the left edge filter. Don't care about them. Like, don't use them. We're, um, for this one, we're not going to focus on them because they might be what is causing you to, uh, to overfit on the training data. So using this, we can now get something like this. So um, we get... 20 uh, epochs later, we get like 93% uh, accuracy. I should say, like, if you're wondering how long you should train, it's sort of like when, when they start doing this, there is no point in training anymore because you're not learning anything on the validation set. Like, you should get to, um, to almost 100 on the training set, but once you get to the point where they diverge too much, you need to do something else to, to fix the overfitting problem. But there is something else that we can do, that humans do, um, and, and that is learning from our past experiences. Not only learning from these 500 um, images, but... I'm sure that when you said ears and eyes and things like that, it's not because you've seen 500 chihuahuas, or I don't think you have, or maybe, maybe you have a chihuahua farm, maybe that's. But um, you probably don't. So you probably learn from a lot of other things, like dogs, other baking goods, things like that. And we can, do, we can let machine learning do that too. So we can take like a huge network based on ImageNet, for example. ImageNet is a huge data set of everyday objects that uh, contain a lot of dogs, actually. Most of the things that are in there are actually dogs. It works perfectly on dogs. Oh, and this is also something you need to be a little bit careful about when you base your, your stuff on, on ImageNet. But um, it's got a lot of dogs, got a lot of baking goods, it's got a lot of tables and different things that you can actually learn from. And even if your data doesn't necessarily look like ImageNet, you can still use ImageNet to learn like small details like colors and, and lines and things like that and features that are good for your, for your subject. So this is uh, ImageNet, it's got like a thousand different categories that it could be. Uh, and what we do is we take the embedding, again the code, um, just use that from a pre-trained model. We don't have to worry about training this part, it's already been done. And then you just tack on your own classifier. So the only thing you do at the end is basically say, give me the embedding, and now you say chihuahua or muffin. I will, I will classify chihuahua or muffin based on these images. This is called transfer learning, and it's super, super, super important in machine learning. So, 
In this case, with this, we actually get close to 100%, precisely because it has a lot of chihuahuas and, and muffins actually in ImageNet. But I just wanted to show you this because this is super, super powerful, and each epoch on this training takes less than a second. So this is something that you can do almost even if you don't have a GPU, like you can do transfer learning on top of an already pre-trained network. If you want to go through and do these projects on your own and things, I do recommend this book. This is a book that's very easy to digest, even if you have no formal machine learning training. It's a good starter book, and it explains all these things. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about how we attack um, actual problems, um, the way my team does it. So. The first thing when we go through um, a machine learning problem is we attack it very much like we do any, any other software ap application. Trying to understand what the customer actually needs. And if, if they need machine learning, that's not a good machine learning project. Like, you never start a machine learning project by needing machine learning. Instead, you need to start a machine learning problem project with a problem that can eventually maybe need machine learning. In fact, most of the cases that I work through, I try to avoid machine learning as much as possible and go back to the basics of software instead. The next thing is figuring out like sort of how will the model be used. So in our cases, will it be used like real time? Because real time has some very, very specific requirements. You can't do a lot of pre-processing. You can't do a lot of expensive, um, expensive image processing, for example, on each frame and things like that. But also the requirements, like for example, in the case of, of the cancer detection, you can't just miss a few. It's not OK. Like, that would be a terrible, terrible thing if you would miss a few cells here and there. You need to at least be as good as the human that does it now, or else you've failed. So, if you have a requirement that's like 100% accuracy or, or precision or recall, precision and recall means basically, can you get something wrong or can you get an overly, like, can you have a lot of true, uh, true, true falses? I don't know. Well, Sorry, true negatives and whatever. You get things wrong. Um, and if you can't get uh, many things wrong, then maybe machine learning is not your thing. Um, and the other thing is, how is it done today? Like, so how, do, how does a doctor actually do this cancer detection? Because that will tell you a lot about what kind of things you might actually use to solve the problem. Because not, very, not many problems are like the Chihuahua and the Muffin case, where you have a bunch of data and out comes an output. Instead, usually a machine learning product tends to be a lot of small pieces that you, that you piece together and eventually create like a much larger model. And also, a very, very important question is if it's feasible or not. Is it feasible to get a lot better accuracy than the realtor on the house price case? Maybe not if you don't have the data that could actually back up that decision. And finally, something that's very close to my heart, and maybe some of you went to my session yesterday, are the ethical concerns around machine learning. Basically, in the case of shoplifting, not trying to uh, predict that a person maybe might be a shoplifter and assume that they are, but instead actually detect when they do shoplifting and things like that. So think about biases that might creep in, how it's going to work for the whole population that you're, uh, you're going to create a model for, et cetera. So understanding the business needs is like by far the biggest part of this. And then you go through and mine the data and like basically get all the supporting data. And not, not before you know how this is normally solved, can you actually decide what type of data you need. Then you clean the data, so in the, in the case of the shoplifting one, we had a lot of cases where um, we, we had like fisheye lenses that we needed to remove because they, we couldn't really work with those. They didn't give us the same uh, kind of patterns that the other uh, videos did. Or uh, things like we also had a clock in a corner, like a, an artifact of the video cam that we needed to remove to avoid training on that and things. 
and explore the data and try to figure out sort of like, can we tell some telltale signs already? Can we, can I make up a logical function for how the house price is gonna be calculated? And if I can, then I should. So this is a, a very true statement for me at least. Like the older I get, the more I realize that the biggest problem to solve in tech is to get people to stop making things harder than they have to be. If you get to the point where you've explored the data and you realize that, dude, I don't need machine learning for this. Like I'm gonna try to find a pattern of like my YouTube users and the best pattern for that is gonna be whatever the pattern was last week then use last week's number. Don't create like a crazy ass model that's gonna predict what your pattern is gonna be. Like if it's apparently visible to you, use that. Because that's gonna be so much more explainable and so much more um, maintainable than any machine learning model. Because a machine learning model is always gonna be probabilistic. It's always gonna maybe give you an answer, maybe give you the right answer, but you're also gonna have a lot of uncertainty of how it reached that conclusion. So once you've explored and decided that, yeah, we are gonna do machine learning here, then you're gonna go through and engineer features. Um, because although I said deep learning can get the features for you, normally we don't have enough samples to do the end-to-end -end deep learning. So we have to split up the problem in multiple um, different small things and engineer features from them that we understand and we can use to create a final model. And then you create a model and you, then you deploy the bomb and run because it's gonna fail. It's gonna fail badly and you need to not be there when that happens. Or maybe you should be there, actually you should be there. And this is where you, you, you test it in a safe environment, you fail, and then you go through the process again. And you refine and you refine until you get to a point where it's actually something that you're ready to release in production and you still reiterate. Because things are gonna change, like the, style, like the house market is gonna change and we're gonna have to rebuild this model. You need to be aware that you need to have a cadence for rebuilding these models. Now, shots on goal. Um, the way we worked is, this is like sort of one of those really, really nice machine learning projects because we had a lot of sampled, uh, a lot of labeled samples, a lot of time, um, people have gone in and said, this was shot on goal, this was a shot on goal, and we had a lot of videos that we could use, and we literally had no consequential decisions. It doesn't matter if we get this wrong. I mean, it's nice if we get it right, but no one will die if we get this wrong. So we went through and explored the data and we found a couple of things. When there was a shot on goal, we had a loud crowd. So we discovered that we could use the audio for this. And we also um, found that the goal was often visible. So we had a bit of a question there about like, should we create a model that actually detects goal or no goal to just test our model and make sure that we're not just doing goal or no goal detection because that's a very possible thing. We also had some ideas around the speed and direction of the players. Could we use that to, uh, to enhance the model to figure out like if the players were running in, in a certain, uh, with a certain speed in a certain direction, they were more likely to do a shot on goal. And then we also had some ideas around player density, which means that um, if someone is shooting goal, and there's usually like a bunch of people huddled together around the ball specifically when that happens. We saw that time after time when we went through the samples. And then we had some player poses that were very specific for shots on goal um, that we could use. And we also saw some other things like scene changes, like after a shot on goal, it was like literally always a shot of, um, um, a shot of Ibrahimovic afterwards. Yeah, so, um, well, not always him, of course, but um, we, did, we wanted to be careful not to pick up just the scene changes and make that like what we were detecting. And again, uh, making sure we're not just checking the goal in, goal in view. But the other really big problem we had was figuring out, uh, as opposed to the Chihuahua or Muffin case, where it's like Chihuahua's here and Muffin's here, what is the opposite of shot on goal? Like 
Crowd pictures is not a shot on goal, but that's so easy for a machine learning model to detect, like the crowd picture versus the shot on goal. So we had to figure out something that was very, very similar to a shot on goal, but not a shot on goal. So we decided to go with attacks that were not directly on goal, because you want to create something that's very hard for, um, for the machine learning model to distinguish between in order to make it as robust as you can. So we did five second videos, we clipped them up into five second videos, and uh, we picked the negative samples as attacks. And then we did um, this. So every, every five second video is now 127 frames, and we went through and we used VGG. So VGG is um, an architecture of a neural network that's pre-trained on, on ImageNet, and you can uh, extract these embeddings from it. So we took the embeddings and put them in a table. So for all 127, we had 127 rows of uh, 1,024 embeddings. And this now became new images, if you will, that we could use in a convolutional neural network. I really like this technique. This was a technique um, that Micha and, and Tim, who were on my team, and kind of came up with. And we could use this both to visualize like what a video actually looks like. So if you can imagine, so these are like, the whites are very high numbers, whereas the blacks are very low numbers. Um, so one of these lines may mean grass. We don't know. It's going to be a lot more abstract than that. But it may mean grass, or it may mean like, you know, a goalpost, or something else. This quite useful. And some of these things are, are more prevalent in the shots on goal. Maybe it means like players, or maybe it means the ball is there, or whatever it could mean. Um, and we also had something odd happening like this. Can someone think of what this might be? Say again? Change of scene. Yeah, the change of the scene. Exactly. So. Um, the reason why we say that's the change of the scene is because suddenly all the features have changed in that, in that one thing. So visualizing something like this and actually seeing these come up like this rather than a large set of numbers that's very hard to sort of grok, then this is a much nicer way to look at this. And we use this and we send this through a new neural network, like a new convolutional neural network, and we got like over 90% accuracy of shot on goal with this. And even when visualizing it on the, um, on the video itself, we could definitely say that when we were predicting high numbers for, uh, for shots on goal, we were definitely like in the shot on goal area. Like in fact, the more interesting the, um, the scene was, the higher of a probability we had. So this was uh, not only a, a yes or a no, but it was a very nice model for, for actually determining how interesting the, um, the actual scene was. So we could have left it at this. We could have just done the uh, VGG embeddings. And this is something that we've now started doing in, in a lot of our projects with VGG embeddings like this. But we also used audio, and this is used from um, a library that extracts the audio features, and, and with the audio features, we also got very high accuracy with the audio features alone. So we created a separate model to do that, and then we now have these models competing and saying, um, do you think it was a shot on goal? Do you think it was a shot on goal? And that way creating a more robust model. We also, um, we haven't actually implemented these, but these were our ideas around um, sort of the people and cluster and things. So think of splitting up the image in a number of, like in a grid pattern, but a pretty coarse grid pattern. And then doing object detection on the people and determining where they are in the squares. So if multiple people show up like close to each other or in the same squares, then you have a higher player density. And also recording things like the size of the squares, because that will tell you now if it's a close-up shot or a crowd shot or like a, a shot with a bunch of players. So that was one, another way to represent this image differently. And to do object detection, again, you can use a pre-trained model, like in this case, a pre-trained model of RetinaNet on, on Coco, which gives you 80 classes 
and a very, very high accuracy of, of like the people detection, for example. So we could use this quite quickly on, on every third frame or something, because it's a little bit more expensive than, um, than you would want to do like on each frame and do player detection on it. Then we did an, uh, just a quick classifier, goal or no goal, again, to, to test that it wasn't picking up the goal or no goal, which it wasn't. And then we also did our own scene change detection, which was taking just a random 20 pixels and verifying if they changed enough between frames that we looked at it as a scene change. So that was used a very simple scene change detector. But again, in CV2, there's also scene change detection. There is plenty of these to go around. We just wanted to do something super, super quick. And uh, we were lucky enough that it wasn't a scene change that it did pick up. And then we went through and we used something called optical flow. Um, so optical flow, let's see here, looks like this. So it takes a number of pixels and it follows them through the um, frames. So what this does is um, it just gives you the speed and direction of certain items. And in our case, we use something that we called focused optical flow, where we decided what it should look at and we decided that it should specifically look at the boxes of the players. This again is not a complicated thing, it's, it looks quite complicated like this, but what it actually does, because pixels don't tend to move that much between frames and don't tend to change that much of luminosity between frames, so it's quite easy to do these calculations. And in CV2 you can do optical flow. Um, we'll go through and quickly look at the cancer detection case. In that case, we had a totally different scenario. We have very, very few positive samples. Um, in fact, in a very large uh, slide, there are generally only a few, um, a few cells that are morphed. And we had extreme accuracy needs, like I mentioned before, but also potential for bias because we don't know necessarily how our model will work. Like we need to be very careful to make sure it works for everyone, like all the patients that could possibly get through here. So, and the way this works is they create biopsy slides, um, like basically take a piece of your skin or a little bit uh, lower down, and then they um, create very thin slices and mark them with a chemical called SOX. And SOX, what it will do is it will mark everything brown that's morphed, that could be malign or benign cancer, but it's definitely a morphed cell that needs to be looking into. And the problems the doctors have is, it's not when, um, at least pass through this, it's not when you have a lot of them, because they will show up and someone can say, yeah, this, we definitely need to look at this slide a bit more and do, do deeper uh, checks to see if it's malign or benign. The problem they had was when there was only one or two cells in these slides, because suddenly uh, the doctors had to go through this humongous, like a million by a million image, zoom in 50 times on every little detail to verify that there was not a cancer cell in there. So the problem is like picking out these needles in the haystack, like picking out the brown dots from them. And one of the problems that we had in order to do any machine learning on it was that they only partially annotated these. So if there was a lot of um, morphed cells, then they only marked a few and said, this is an example of a morphed cell. So we can't use the, the rest saying that they were not morphed. So instead of doing machine learning on this, we decided to do something completely different. We decided that since the doctors, the way they work, they work just looking for brown or blue in this case, and it's quite um, nicely differentiated with the brown and the blue. So we just um, sort of um, clustered the different colors in, in the image to, to cluster the blues together and the browns together. And then uh, separate them out like this, basically just doing color decomposition, and, this, and then create a mask where we only extract the, um, the cells that are morphed. 
and then cluster them together using something called convex hull. Then again, it's not a machine learning thing. It's a it's a, just a general graphics processing thing. But this way, we could now um, actually mark them out in the exact same way that the doctors do with very high accuracy because we're not doing anything probabilistic like machine learning. We're doing something very factual like decomposing colors. Something that we know that the reason why I see this or not see this is because the colors are different and the doctors can trust this. So this is a case of not using machine learning and I really wanted to show that too. And um, lastly, the shoplifting case is quite interesting because in this case we also had very few samples and they didn't have a lot of examples of shoplifting and it turned out that the examples they had were some of them were shoplifting into clothes and some into a bag and some were just walking out with whatever they shoplifted and things like that. So even the cases we had were very varied and there wasn't like a deep pattern to them. And it's very, very sensitive to bias. So it's very, very sensitive to picking up things like, um, these were some of the things that we found when, when we did the data analysis, but it's very sensitive to picking up that if you were a man 20 to 40 and wore a hoodie, that was like the major demographic in the, uh, in the shoplifting case, right? And we wanted to make sure that we did not create a model that said, man, 20 to 40 with a hoodie, shoplifter. Because that's, you know, it's, well, yeah, you, you realize why that's a problem. Uh, and obviously also, we didn't also want to go in and say, hey, if you covered your face and you're alone, you're automatically a shoplifter, because that is also not the case. Um, so instead we had to go and look at the shoplifting poses. So, um, let me scroll this through. So in the middle we say one of the, one of the things that we always try to do is detect versus predict. So detect that someone is shoplifting, detect the poses, detect the actual action instead of doing predictive policing and, and assuming that someone will um, be a shoplifter just because they are a certain demographic. A couple of other things we had problems with, I mentioned the fisheye, but also the fact that most of the samples we had from shoplifting were taken during the Christmas season, because that was sort of like, they had grabbed a certain um, set of their videos and, and extracted the shoplifting from them. So we wanted to make sure that we did not um, detect Santa Claus and assume that someone was shoplifting, because that, well, Maybe that's not as bad as detecting men 20 to 40. Um, so in order to, uh, to make sure that the samples were similar enough, we actually picked negative sampling from the, actual, the same videos that shoplifting was from. And we also decided to uh, take when people were shopping and when people looked sort of like the same way, they were in the same situations as when they were shoplifting, but they were just shopping around, like they were shopping for the same type of items and that kind of thing, rather than taking empty aisles. And for post detection, we also used like a pre, um, pre-trained model to get like the key items out and use those as features for the post detection. But then we used um, this um, background subtraction, and this is again an open CV thing. So if you work with, with vision, you'll always do sort of open CV. So what this does is it says anything that's moving is something that I want to filter out. Now you can see as, as long as the camera is stationary, we only see the people in here. Later on, as the camera starts moving, we'll see that other things become white. Um, but in our case with the shoplifting, our cameras were always stationary. So this way we could extract only the moving things, only the people, and do our machine learning on that, which was a quite useful thing to avoid having the um, having things like the floor um, or um, Christmas lighting or things like that show up. And then we did classification at the box level. We did classification only on the people. So to sum this up, like a little domain knowledge and understanding and doing a lot of data analysis and prep goes a long way. Um, and you most often need to do like 
composite, composite models more than end-to-end -end models, mostly because you don't have enough data and you want to have a little bit more granularity around uh, what your model actually picks up to make it more interpretable. And the last thing I want to leave with is keep it simple. Like, don't just apply machine learning because it's fun. Apply machine learning where it makes sense. But if you have a case like the, um, like the cancer detection case where you can solve it in a different way that's better, use that. And finally, if you want to learn more about the way we do things, um, we have a channel called Machine Learning at Microsoft where me and my team um, do paper reviews, but also talk about our cases that we work on. So if you're interested in that, please go in and um, watch and subscribe that. But with that, I want to thank you so much for showing up this early. I really appreciate it. Thanks.